Isn't the church awesome? God is faithful. Come on, say God is faithful. Come on, say God is faithful. It is true and He is real. Even when you don't feel Him, He's faithful. Even when you don't see Him at work in your life, He's faithful. All right? He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. Even when you don't see Him, He's faithful. Even when you don't feel Him, He's faithful. He's a faithful God. Can I get that to you? He's faithful, right? He's faithful. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. We're talking about our, our, our series, which is God is. God is faithful. Last time we talked about God as protector. Now God is faithful. And in Revelation, we're going to talk about John, the revelator. And we're going to show that John had interesting things. We're going to talk about in 17, verse 17 through 18. Revelations 1, it says this in 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And when he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first, the last, and I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades, or that word we're going to, you can say, I hold the keys of hell. I hold the keys. So say, come on, say it with me. God is faithful. God is faithful. Come on, say it one more time. All right. So John, let me help you understand. John is on the island of Pathos. And so John is, is here, and the island of Pathos is like, Four miles uh, off the coast of Ephesus. Now, this island, they would ship prisoners to this place because if you were shipped to this place, this island, it was the death penalty, basically. You were sent there, and in this island, they, they, would, they, they would send people to die. This place, didn't, that you couldn't grow anything. It was all surrounded by salt water, no vegetation, rocky place, hard to survive. It's surrounded place, so they knew when they dropped off these prisoners, they're going to die. But it, they, didn't, they didn't kill him. They just dropped him there at this place. So John is there, and John is placed at this island of Pathos because he was preaching the word of God. So he's thrown in prison. Let me show you Revelation 1.9. I, John, your brother, and companion in suffering in the, for the, and the kingdom, of, and kingdom and patient endurance that our Lord in Jesus was on the island of Pathos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's on this island because he's preaching God's word. And so we know that John, it says there, the testimony of Jesus, and we all know if you've come to Wednesday services, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and the spirit of prophecy is scriptural foretelling what's going to happen in your life before it happens. So John is going to start prophesying. He's going to start talking about revelation. He's going to start getting prophecy. And so we see this guy, John. Now, right away you're thinking, man, this ain't fair. This guy is, is wrongly in, was imprisoned. Because and, and, and treated like a hardened criminal because of preaching God's word. I mean, that's not fair. But see, John doesn't have a choice. He's, he's put here. And, and, and that same kind of thing with us. And we, we can be wrongly accused, be wrongly uh, uh, treated. Someone else did something to us and we couldn't do anything about it. And we have a, two choices. You can get bitter or you can get better. Your choice. John had a choice. He says, I can get bitter and hate God because, man, I'm serving you, God, and then here you are doing this to me. Or I can get better and I can turn this, this lemon into lemonade or something. You know, I can turn this bad into something good. Okay? Or whatever your, whatever your fruit is. You can turn avocados into guacamole or whatever it is. You know? So John is looking and he has a decision. Look what it says in Revelation 1.10. I want you to see his choice. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. John made a choice. I'm not going to get bitter. I'm going to get better. And so life throws him a curveball and you can walk in bitterness all day long, but you cannot walk in bitterness and be in, in the presence of God. You cannot have this bitterness on you and unforgiveness and hatred. God is faithful. And even in our worst experiences, God is faithful and he's going to show himself faithful to John. But John is ready to receive, and he has a great outlook. He has a great look at life now. He's not seeing life and saying, man, life is terrible. He's saying, no, 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 no. I have an opportunity to make my life better, and I choose not to be bitter. I choose to make myself better. Because the past is the past, and the future is looking great. Your rearview mirror is how big? It's about this big, right? Your rearview mirror is about that big? 
And what's the, how, how big is the, the front window, sh- the, the, the windshield? It's this big. So your future is this big, and your, and your past is that big. And you're only supposed to, do you always drive looking at your rearview mirror and you drive like this? You don't drive like that. You glance at your rearview mirror, right? It's just a glance. It's just a look. And that's how your past is. It's just a glance. Yeah, I used to be like that, but I got a great future looking at front of me. Yeah, I'm just looking. Oh, yeah, I just, there's my past. Yeah, I see it. I see my rearview mirror. I see it. But it's only this big. And my future's this big. And so you're supposed to be looking forward, not behind. Because you can't drive correctly if you're doing this. And God says, stop looking at your past. Stop looking at everything that you did and that everything that you, you may have made a mistake and just look forward at the huge. The Bible says, Jeremiah 29 and 7, he says, I've got plans to prosper you, plans to give you future and a hope. I got plans. If you don't got plans, I got plans. God says, I'm just looking for people who are willing to get in, get in line with me. See, there's this spectrum of life. Spectrum of light of life is that on this side of the spectrum, there's people that are going through all kinds of hell right now, right there in, in here. Life is just nasty. It's just, I'm just it ain't working. Things are just horrible. And, you know, God is not coming through, so you say. And so things are just not right. Just my world is turned upside down. And then over here on the spectrum of life, over here, everything's okay. You know, my bills are paid. I'm doing all right. Kids are, are well, you know. The, you know, the Chihuahua's acting all right. You know, everything's okay. You know, everything's cool. It could be better. And then there's these people in the middle that, yeah, it's not too, it's, uh, but it's, it could be better. And we're right. Everyone in here is somewhere in the spectrum of life. Things are horrible. Things are okay. Things are somewhere in the middle. But we all fall somewhere in this spectrum of life. Because we all have something in, co- in, in, in common. We all need an experience with God. We all need an experience with God. Even I do. Just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean I'm excluded from things and being persecuted and having to walk my, my Christian life out. I fall. I make mistakes. But you know what? The same spirit of God that's in me is the same Holy Spirit that's in you. No difference. I have to walk out my life. i got to work out my salvation. I gotta work on my marriage. I gotta work on my kids. I gotta discipline. I've gotta do the same thing you do. But it's a matter of whether or not you believe God that He is gonna be, He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Are you gonna trust God enough? Are you gonna do the things that you need to do? And see, God is faithful and He wants to step into your life right now. But see, God is not pushy. He's not gonna come into your life if you don't want Him in your life. He's not a demon. He's not, he's not some ugly spirit that just wants to take over. God is, is a gentle. He's, he's a gentleman. He says, if you don't want me, that's fine, but I'll be right here. If you don't want me in your life, I'll, 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 I'm right here. But God is ready to give healing and finances and, and your marriage and family. And I tell you, see, I've heard people say, well, pastor, it's easy for you to stay up there and say that when everything is all right. Yeah, it is. But then there are times when it isn't hard. It isn't easy. There's times when I, I get up here and I'm like, there are things going in my life, but I'm still going to preach. I'm still going to believe God, and I'm going to say the things I'm going to say it by faith. I have bad days too. We all have our bad days. But the Bible doesn't say we, we go walk by our flesh. We don't walk by what we see. We walk by faith, and faith starts speaking what is going to happen in their life before it happens. That's faith. It's easy to be happy when the car's sitting in the garage. Let's believe God when the car's not sitting in the garage, and you got to believe God for a car and still be as happy that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And today I want to show you th- four things that God is faithful. Number one, if you're taking notes, because it's good to take notes on the test, God is faithful as a comforter. He's faithful as a comforter. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And when he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Notice he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. God is faithful no matter what news or anyone is telling you. He is faithful. He's a faithful comforter. And see, John, he's on this island of pathos, and he thinks he's all by himself. You ever had that feeling when you think you're in the house and you think you're the only one there? And you know, and all, and then he hears this thing behind him 
this loud voice, this... trumpet and it's loud and it's, and it's coming this way so he's, he thinks he's by himself you want to come up here? so he's up there john is by himself he's like this he thinks i'm all alone and all of a sudden he hears this loud sound and the, and the bible says he fell at his feet Afraid. Do that one more time. I love that thing. Wow. That's a real ram story. All right, give it up for Andy. That's good. That's cool. He hears this loud thing. It's probably louder than that. And the dude, look what he says in Revelation 117. He said, I saw him and I fell at his feet as though dead. I would have fallen dead too. If I'm there by myself and I'm like, nobody else is here, nobody else is here, nobody else. <laughs> and that's what he does. He falls to his feet all dead. <laughs> and he falls at his feet. Look what it says. He says, then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not fear. And John remembers how that touch was. He probably remembers. I remember that touch. I remember that. I remember when I was watching him on the Mount of Transfiguration, and I freaked out, and he came by, and he touched us, and I remember that touch. I remember that touch. And he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And you know what? God is going to do this right now. I believe as I'm speaking the rest of here, this rest of this message, you're going to feel the, the comforter come by you. And he's going to put his hand on you, and you're going to feel that, that comforting presence. Because God wants to be a comforter. And look what it says here. In verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Duh, I would have tough. I would have too. I would have been that way. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. You know, in the Bible, it's written 366 times, do not be afraid, probably for every day of the week uh, of the year, and then maybe an extra one for leap year and other, other places. So, you know, there's a place here 366 times, and today I'm telling you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The comforter is with you. He's with you. The comforter is with you. Somebody made a lot of money by saying no fear and just put it on T-shirts and made tons of money. No fear. Got it from the Bible. No fear. No fear. And so God is telling us, he says in Psalms 23, verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He's a God of peace. He's a God of comforting. He's the peace in the storm. He's the God of peace. He's a comforting person. God wants me to experience peace. Look what it says in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not give, I do not give you the world, the peace that the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In other words, no fear. Because God is faithful and he says, I am faithful in the midst of your trouble. I am a comforter. He's a faithful comforter. Amen. Number two, let's go to number two. God is a faithful conqueror. Come on, say conqueror. He's a conqueror. Revelation 1, 18. I am the living one. I was dead, and now I am alive forever and ever. The same power that gives you peace is the same power that gives you conquering power. It's the same power. The same power that saves people and gives their, and, and gives their life and changes their life is the same power that heals. It's the same power that gives you peace. And it says here, he is the living one. He is the one that gives you power. The same power is a conquering power. Got to tell you this. We serve a risen king. He's not in the grave like all the other gods. They're still in the grave. They're still stuck there. Our God rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. He conquered it. Amen. Come on, give him a praise. Come on. He's good. Did, I tell you what, did you ever feel that your problems are bigger than what you can handle? You ever felt that? Come on, come on up, man. Come on. Won't you, won't you, won't you help me? He's going to help me. And, and you're going to help me too. Come on, come on, Alex. Come on, come on help me. I need, I need somebody. Hey, Dan. Dan, come on here, Dan. You're going to be God. Because I, I serve a big God. All right, you're going to be trouble. You're going to be trouble. Who else wants me in my trouble? Andy, you're, you're my trouble too. <laughs> Double trouble. Oh, duh. <laughs> All right, you stand this way. You stand facing me. You stand facing me over here, right next to him. 
And you stand facing next to him. Yeah. There's my trouble. There's God. Yo, God, what's up? I got problems. These guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to get into God, and they're not gonna, they're not gonna, they're not gonna let me. Dude, ah, they gonna be so rude. They're not gonna let me, right? I can yell at them, get out of the way, get, get out of the way. I can try to go around them, and they're not gonna let me go around them. I won't try to go this way. I, I won't try to go underneath their legs. No, they're not gonna let me. They're there. I can t- yell at them all my life. I, I get out of the way. Get out of the way. Did I spit at you? Sorry. I love you, baby. I can't get through. Isn't that how it feels sometimes? It's like, man, I got some huge problems. I'm not saying y'all are huge. I got some, I got some big problems. And I, no matter what I do, I can't get through. My mountain is too big. My problem is too big. And instead of me trying to get through my problems, let's ask God to go through the problems and come to me. And let's let God come to me because God is bigger than all my problems. Y'all gonna mess with my God? Mess mess with my God? Y'all got thank you. Come on, get down. All right, you're no longer God, all right? You're no longer God. Just, just, that was it, just for that moment. I don't want you getting a big old thing. I'm God. You understand this? Let God, get God involved in your problems. Once you bring God, instead of having, trying to get through it yourself, let's just say, God, can you just get involved in this here? And let God take care of that. He's able to move things. He's able to get things out of the way. And God is able to fight. The Bible says he wants to fight my battles. He wants to fight for me. He works hard. He does it. He, there is no problem as big as my God. No problem. No heat, no, no, no sickness, no disease, no heart, no, no worse. That no matter what it is, God, there's nothing too big than my God. So let's get him involved. No, all right. Number three, God is faithful carrier of the keys. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death, hell, and the graves. Have you ever locked your ha- you locked your keys in your car? Anybody? Come on, all of y'all. Come on, man. I know I'm gonna have to pray for people here. We all lock their keys in your car, right? There, and and you, you hope you have what? The spare. Uh, with you, hopefully. And maybe under the car or something. I don't know. But you all, I mean, it's weird because you lock your keys in your car, and then, and then you're just looking in the window, you know, thinking that somehow it's going to gravitatedly pull or something. And you're just looking in there. And then, the, and then people do this. Oh, people do this. How'd you do that? You just want to just put down your Christianity real quick? Say, brother, I've only been saved for a little while. You just, uh, yeah, I, I, I locked them in there and I crawled out the exhaust pipe. Yeah, that's how I did it. And now I'm sitting here looking at it. How else did I do that? You locked them in there. So you're hoping there's a spare key. I hope I have a spare and so you get the spare, or you're going to have to get a locksmith to come and, and, and open up the door. But let me tell you this. The devil does not have a spare key. Doesn't have a spare. The Bible says that he took. It's a, if Jesus has them, the devil doesn't have death, hell, and the grave. He took them. The minute you die, the minute you die, Jesus Christ unlocks death and allows you to go. You don't even experience death. You, as soon as you die as a Christian, you die, bam, you're in, you're in right in the presence of God. You don't experience, you close your eyes, you're now looking at God. You don't experience that. You don't die and all of a sudden, well, I'm going to come back as a tree. No, you ain't going to come back as that. Well, I'm just going to die. I'm gonna, maybe a horse fly. I don't know. Maybe it all depends on how good I was. Maybe, maybe I'll be come back as some butterfly. No. The Bible says when you die... Death has to escort you, has to open it up and let you go to heaven. You don't die like an animal. Animal has no spirit. It, an animal just dies and dies, but you have a spirit. You're, you have this outside thing called the earth suit, and then you have this thing called a will, a mind, and then you have something else called a spirit. And that spirit gives vitality to this body. You're not who this outside, this ain't the real you. The real you's in there. 
And when you die, you take off your earth suit and you go to heaven. They're just not this mystical place that you say, oh, I want to end up somewhere. Maybe on Pluto or Mars. I don't know. No. When you close your eyes for the last time on this earth and you open them, you see the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he says, well done, faithful, good, and servant. Come on in for those who have given their life to Christ. The Christian doesn't have to experience death. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, we are confident, I say, I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. The Bible says that he reminds us that God is faithful and that the Bible says he's faithful to prepare a mansion for us. The Bible says he's going to prepare something for you. He says, I'm leaving and because I'm leaving to go for, to prepare a place for you. He didn't say a, a, an apartment. <laughs> he says, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you, a place for you. And it's because of you. I'm doing it all because of you. And I'm coming back. And he says, he reminds us that God is faithful to uphold his promises. He says, I am going to perform everything that my word, that the word of God says. Every place that where my word says, I'm going to perform it. He backs up his word. And that's our last point. Number four, God is faithful to back up his word. God is faithful to back up his word. Jeremiah 112, it says this. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. There is nothing that God cannot handle in your life. Everything in your life God can handle. God is faithful. He's faithful. Jesus has the keys to anything in life that you need. You know, when he told Abraham, Abraham he told Moses, hey, Moses, go tell Pharaoh that I am is coming. I am. I am. I am what, what, what do you mean I am? Just tell him I am coming. I am coming? Who's I am coming? He says, I am whatever you want me to be. I don't, I, I put a blank check on there, uh, 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 Moses. It's a blank check. It says, I am. And then you fill in the blank. Well, I need healing. I am healing. Well, I need protection. I am protection. Well, I am peace. I am peace. He is whatever you want him to be. That's God. Whatever you want God to be, he'll be that because he's I am. He doesn't put himself in a box and say, I'm only this. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's Jehovah. He can do whatever he, he's God. He's God. I am. Those kids are getting the word full in the man. I got to get Frankie out there more often. These kids are excited or it's the root beer, the holy root beer's on them. <laughs> Something. <laughs> That's so good. Look at it says, Jeremiah 1.12. Then he said, the Lord said to me, you have seen well, I'm alert, I'm active, I'm watching my word to perform it. God is waiting for you to say, I need, I am healing in my life. I need the I am in my life because he's faithful. Psalms 119 verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalms 119 verse 15, I'm giving you word. I will meditate on your precepts or your word. I have respected your ways, the path of life marked out by your Bible, by your word. The word of God, Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart that the word of faith, which we preach, the word of God. Look at Isaiah. I want you to see this. I'm going to teach you something, and I know I've gone over a little bit, but I'm going to teach you something, and you're going to leave here going, man, I got something. It was worth the price of admission. It was awesome because it was free. You didn't pay anything, all right? Isaiah 43, verse 26. Watch this. Look what it says. Isaiah. There's a Romans, baby. There's the other one. My daughter's in there. That's why I said baby. Okay. <laughs> it's Isaiah 43, verse 26. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. That word contend. We sometimes think that God is going to fight with me. Come on, God, let's fight. Like Jacob did. Let's contend together. Because we saw ja we saw Jacob fighting with God, right? Remember that? And then he went... Pow! And he's like, remember? Remember me. But see, if you're going to fight God, God just has to look at you and you're vaporized and you're dead. So it's not fighting against God. That word contend, contender, he or she is in possession to get the prize. We have, the, it's a fighter. They say this, the, this is the fighter that is ready to get the belt. He's the, he's the heavyweight contender. He's the lightweight contender. There's no one else in front of him. It's going to come to you. There's nobody else in front of him. He's, 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 the, he's right there. He's a, he or she is ready to fight the next person. 
God is saying this. Look what he's saying. There's no one in front of you. As long, he's saying this, let's contend together. Let's you and I fight together. Let's you and I contend with each other. Let's you, there's no one else in front. He says, as long as you're talking to me about your sin and I'm talking to you about your covenant, you and I are fighting on the other side of two teams. But he says, so long as you and I get together and talk the same thing, we're going to get some things done. He says, let us contend together. Let us fight the same thing. Let's get on the same side. Let us get on the same side and fight together. That's what the word of God says. So the Bible says, if I say you're healed, then I want you to say I'm healed. That's what he's saying. He says, if my Bible says, if my word says that you're blessed, I want you to say I'm blessed. Let's contend together. Let's fight together. It says, if my Bible says that you can, all things are possible, then you're going to say all things are possible. Let's fight together, he says. I don't, don't let's be on, the, on either side. He says, fight with me. I'm the champion. I've never lost a battle. Fight with me. Come on, fight with me. He says, I'm the Lord strong, mighty in battle. Watch this. Look at this. This is so strong. In Isaiah 43, verse 26, he says, he says this. State your case. Go ahead and put it up there. Isaiah 43, verse 26. He says, state your case that you may be acquitted. It's a legal term he's using. State your case. Bring evidence about you, about healing. Bring evidence. Bring evidence on this. He says, tell me what I said I would do and remind me of my covenant. He says, state your case. When you go to a, stand in front of a judge, what do you got to do? You got to bring some what? Evidence. So that you can do what? State your case. So that you can be what? Acquitted. Look at the next thing it says down there. Come on, put it up there. Put up there, Isaiah 43, verse 26. It says, state your case that you may be acquitted. He says, bring evidence. Bring evidence of the things that I have said about you. Bring it so that you may be acquitted of all the wrong. Bring my truths. Bring it to me where I said that I will forgive you of all unrighteousness. Bring it to me so that I, you may be forgiven of all unrighteousness, so that you may be acquitted. You know why? Because you've got jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Juris means the law. Diction means the right to say. I have the right to say I am healed. You've got jurisdiction. One officer can't get on the other place. They always say, well, you don't have jurisdiction. Well, the Bible says that I've got all jurisdiction. I have the right, I have the legal right to speak things into my life. God has given you jurisdiction to say, I have the right to be free. I have the right to be healed. I have the right to be supplied all my needs. I have the right for a new life. I have the right to be free and to have a successful life. God is saying this. He's saying, state your case. You know what? If you're going to be quiet, don't blame God because you've yet to bring your case. Don't blame God. God is ready to perform his word. He's given you the jurisdiction, the right to speak and to say, I'm free. And the Bible says, then you are free. So today I want you to bring evidence to God. I want you to believe that God, he is a faithful God, that he is going to perform and back up his word because he's given you the right. You've been acquitted. You've been, you've been acquitted of all unrighteousness. You have been given uh, 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 ownership of, of the of things that he has given you. You have, you have total forgiveness. But you need to state your case. Come on, close your eyes. I want you to believe God. I want you to believe God with me. The devil doesn't have jurisdiction over you. You have jurisdiction over your life. God has given you the right to speak over things over your life. God has given you the right to do it. And he's waiting for you to bring your case. State your case. State your case. Well, God, I need healing. Then you're healed. God, I need peace. Then you're at peace. God, I need joy. Then joy. God, I need this. Then, then this. Bring it so that you may be acquitted. He's, a, he's faithful. He's faithful. Remind God that he's faithful. Remind him that he said he would heal you. Remind him that, that he would provide for you. Remind him that he's going to be protector, healer. Remind him that he's everything that you need. Remind God. Bring him the evidence 
so that you can be acquitted. Today, I want you to remember that he is a faithful God. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. It doesn't matter what you've done. It's not a matter about your past. He's faithful. Bring him some evidence. Bring him some stuff and say, Lord, the Bible says this, that if I, if I, if I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life, he's faithful and just to come into my life and forgive me of all unrighteousness and to give me another chance. God is the God of many chances. He's not mad at you. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Amen. And you're making all things new. You are making all things new. Come on. You are making all things new. We are free. Oh, he's making it. And you're making all things new. And you're making all things new. You are making all things new. We are free. Come on, sing that. And you're making all things new. Come on. You are making all things new. Come on, he's doing it. Come on, he's doing it. All things new. Yes, he is. We are free. Come on, they'll stand. Come on, everybody stand. You are making all things new. Come on, just say to the Lord. You are making all things new. You are making all things new. And we are free. Come on, tell the Lord. You are making all things new. Tell him, make it. You are making all things new. Yes, Lord. You are making all things new. And we are free. One more time. You are making all things new. You are making all things new. You are making all things new. We are free. I want to pray with you before we close. You might say, well, what do I need prayer for? You need someone to stand in agreement for you. Before we close, I don't want to close without having the opportunity to pray with you or someone to pray with you. you say, Pastor, I need God. He's faithful, but I, 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 need him. I just need prayer over my life. I want to give my life to God. Or, I, or you might just say, Pastor, I just need to know that he is faithful and I just need you to pray over me and believe that with me. Or to believe that there's belief for me for healing because I'm stating my case for healing. I'm stating my case for prosperity. I'm stating my case for joy, peace. If that's you, I want you to come up here just a bit. When we, when we, uh, when we sing this next song again, I want you to make your way up here, and I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to be long. I want to pray with those who are desperately looking for God and say, Lord, I want to take you serious. My past is my past, and my future now is bright. I want to look ahead now. I want to speak great things. If God is speaking great things about me, then I want to speak great things about myself. I want to start a new thing. I want to wipe the slate clean, and I want to start a new life. I want to start a good way. And it doesn't mean you're never going to fall, but it does mean that God is now inside of you, and he's living with you, and he's living inside of you. So let's do that. As soon as we start playing, I want you to come, and I'm going to pray with you, and then we're going to dismiss. But before we dismiss, I want to pray with those that need prayer. Amen. Come on, let's sing this song. You are making all things new. Come on, if you need prayer. You are